fear is a dead end. But faith always has a future. Fear opens the door for Satan to work in our life. Faith opens the door for God to work in our life. We're doing a series on confrontation. Everybody hates it, but if we don't do it, our lives are really going to be a mess. There's many things that we need to confront. We need to confront fear. Because if you don't confront it, it will rule you and control you. You can say, well, I'm praying not to be afraid, but that's not enough. When we pray, God very often gives us something to do. He gives us courage to confront situations. If you feel that you're being controlled by fear, you need to pray and ask God to help you. But what he's going to give you is the courage to confront it. He's not going to necessarily just make every feeling of fear go away. Matter of fact, I can tell you that at different times in your life, you're going to feel fear. I'm a pretty bold person, but there's times when I feel fear. Usually when we get in a situation that's new for us, we'll feel fear. When we get in a situation where we feel we're kind of over our head and don't really know what to do, we'll feel fear. There's all kinds of fears. Actually, if you look up phobias, the different types of phobias, there are literally pages of things that people become afraid of. We get afraid of people and we let them rule our lives. We need to confront people that are manipulative and controlling. You're going to stand before God and answer for your life. And you need to make sure that you're listening to God about your life and doing what God wants you to do. Not being manipulated and controlled by somebody else who's not going to give an account for your life. Amen. We need to confront boldly, we need to boldly confront situations in our life. We should never be afraid of circumstances. We should never be afraid of trouble, of trials and tribulations. Because the greater one lives in us. First of all, I'd like us to look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Thank you, Father, for the word today. Let it be rich and powerful and impacting and make a huge difference. Huge difference in our lives. 2 Peter 3, 14. So, beloved, since you are expecting these things, He's talking about the time when Jesus comes back and the heavens are parted. How many of you are expecting the second coming of Christ? Yes. How many of you think there is a possibility it could even be in your lifetime? Yes. Amen. And even if it's not, we want to live ready. Yes. Hallelujah. So, beloved, since you're expecting these things, be eager to be found by him at his coming without spot or blemish and at peace in serene confidence, free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. When Jesus comes back, how do you want him to find you? Anxious, worried, frustrated, upset, ready for a breakdown, running from everything in fear, timidity, no confidence, never having fulfilled your destiny. How does he want to find you? The Bible says he wants to find us living a holy life without spot or blemish. It says that he wants to find us in confidence. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. He wants to find us free from fear and agitating passions. Now, I don't know how you feel, but I came to the point a long time ago in my life, I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to be a Christian, then I'm going to be a full-on hardcore Christian. I'm not going to just have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world and just be lukewarm and just hope I can squeak in the back door of heaven. So every time I read in here that God wants me to do something, I get about trying to be what he wants me to be. When we read in here what God wants us to do, then we need to set about praying about it, getting in agreement with God, and we need to work with the Holy Spirit to move in the direction of the will of God. So when I read in here God when he comes back, he wants to find me confident, then that makes me want to get rid of all lack of confidence. 
When I read in here that he, when he comes back, he wants to find me at peace. Wow. Took me so many years just to get peaceful. Now I believe that he could come back and find me at peace. He wants to find us free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. When he comes back, I want him to find me in the right condition. The Bible tells us that in the last days, people's hearts are going to fail them for fear. Let me tell you something. If you look around at everything that's going on in the world today and you read the paper too much and listen to the news too much, you're going to be a mess. You need to read the good news, not the bad news. We need to pay more attention to God and what He says than what the world says. I'm telling you, I know conditions are bad in the world, but I also know that God has His eye on us. And I know that He has promised, if we will keep our eyes on Him, that He will always take care of us. And so don't get all caught up in the negativity of this is going to happen, and oh, that's going to happen, and this is going to happen. Have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? Just keep your eyes on God and do what you're supposed to do and trust God to take care of you. In Luke 18, the Bible says, who will he find in faith when he comes back? Verse 1 says, we ought always to pray and never turn coward and faint and give up. We should always keep pressing in with God. Tells a story about a woman who went to an unjust judge to be vindicated from something. And the judge didn't want to mess with her. But she kept pestering him. Kept pestering him. And finally he gave in just to get her to be quiet. And then it says, if an unjust judge will finally do that, what will our just God do? For those who refuse to quit and give up. And let me tell you something. It does not take any special talent to give up. I mean, I used to threaten that give up thing three, four times a week, and I'm sure God was not the least bit impressed. And I get kind of weary of Christians who give up. It doesn't take any special talent to give up. You don't even have to be saved to give up. You don't have to do nothing to give up. Anybody can give up. But it takes courage to press forward and keep believing what the Word of God says during those seasons in your life where it looks to you in your circumstances like none of it is true. The Bible says that we sometimes look like sheep led to the slaughter. You ever feel like that? But right in the midst of all of these things, we are more than conquerors. You know what it means to be more than a conqueror? This is my own definition. This comes from the Joyce Dictionary. I believe what it means to be more than a conqueror is you know before you ever get the problem that you already have the victory. You know before the battle ever starts that you've already won the battle. You know why? Because you've already read the end of the book. You know who the winner is. I mean, honestly and truly, if we base our life on this, we cannot fail. <laughs> it is not even an option. We cannot fail. You may go through some things. It may take longer than you thought it would and be harder than you thought it would. But in the end, the meek shall inherit the promises of God. Amen. And it ain't over till it's over, and it ain't over yet. I'm tired of people disrespecting Christians and disrespecting God. And one of the reasons why they disrespect God is because of the way Christians act a lot of times. And I think we either need to get in, get out, or get run over. But God's on the move. <laughs> and if we're going to call ourselves Christians, which means Christians, then we need to start acting like it. Can anybody say amen? amen? Fear is a dead end, but faith always has a future. Fear opens the door for Satan to work in our life. Faith opens the door for God to work in our life. Let me say it again. Fear is a dead end. Faith, however, always has 
a future. There's a scripture that I absolutely love in John chapter 11. It's the account of where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're not going to go over that whole story, but in John chapter 11, verse 40, he said, Did I not tell you if you would only believe, you would see the glory of God? If you would only believe. You know, in many circumstances and situations, you don't have a clue what to do, but one thing you can do is believe. You can keep believing. Matter of fact, I know how easy it is to get into doubt and unbelief. I know how easy it is to become afraid. And so I keep this sign sitting in my office right across from the chair that I sit in. And every time I glance up from my reading and my time in the morning where I spend time with God, I see that belief. Because I want to be reminded that there's only really one thing that God is asking me to do. And that's believe what he said. Amen. And if I'll do that... God will show me when I need to do something else, and when he does, he'll give me the grace to do whatever it is he asks me to do. Believing causes you to enter the rest of God, and there's no place better to be than in the rest of God. Oh, my gosh. When you're in the rest of God, it's like you know God's going to do something. You don't know what. You don't care what. You don't care when. It just really doesn't make you any difference because you have the confidence that God is faithful, and when the time is right... Not your time, his time. When the time is right, then God's going to come through. I think some of you would do you well if you had one of these signs also. There's a lot of little places where you can buy things like this, or I don't care, cut one out of cardboard and paint it and put it on your wall. It doesn't matter. But get something in front of your face to remind you to not be afraid, to not get into doubt and unbelief, to not run away from things but to start believing God. Only believe. And you will see the glory of God. I can't promise you when. Can't promise you how. But I do know not only by the word of God, but now thankfully I've had enough experience with God that I also know by experience that God is faithful. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to talk to you about some specific fears that we encounter in our life. Some common fears. I won't cover all the list of fears, but just to kind of throw some out that I think a lot of people deal with, and I think this will be interesting for us. First of all, one of the things that I think that many people are afraid of is that we're afraid we're not going to get what we want. Think about that. Oh my gosh, I, I'm single and I want to be married. And what if I, what if I stay single my whole life? <laughs> See, we get like that, don't we? It's like. Oh. We have these things that we want God to do for us. And the very thought of not getting what we want just makes us almost frantic. Now, I'm going to use an example from my ministry, although this might not relate to your specific case, but you'll still get the point. When God called me to do what I'm doing, he put such a desire in me to do it that for a while it almost drove me crazy. Because when you want something so bad you can't hardly stand it and yet nothing's happening. <laughs> How many of you know where I'm at right now? It's like <laughs> frustrating to the point where you feel like you could just split wide open. And it was very difficult during those years because God had such a hold on me that I couldn't give up. And yet, for reasons that I didn't understand then, but I do now, character flaws in me that he was dealing with, he wouldn't let me go on. So I couldn't give up, and I couldn't go on. I couldn't have a failure, and he wasn't letting me have a success. And somewhere in the midst of all that, I was getting squashed. 
And one day I was reading in John chapter 21, where Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Third time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then I went on to read the rest of it. I'm going to make sure I have the right verse before I tell him to, to put it up. I think it's verse 18, John 21, 18. Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know. Do you love me? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes, you know I love you. 15, 16, 17. So God asked him this three times because he's getting ready to drop a bomb on him. Verse 18, well, I assure you, Peter, and most solemnly I tell you, when you were young, let's just say when you were a baby Christian, you girded yourself you put on your own belt or girdle and you walked about wherever you pleased to go. Baby Christians just get to do whatever they want to. You just cute little sweet little thing, you. And you can just pray for just about anything and God will just pinch your little cheeks and give it to you. You can get by with some of the dumbest stuff. You can need a word from God and just do one of these. You can have your little box of promise cards all over the house and you can go and just get a word from God. But now you trust me, the day is going to come when you're going to have to grow up. And a lot of that stuff is not going to work anymore. Because God wants us eventually to be led by His Spirit. Not by all kinds of outward signs and feelings and confirmations and angel appearances and prophecies and all that stuff. A real Christian sometimes has to go through years of what you might call a dry time. However, you can get to the point where you know God so well that dry doesn't even feel dry to you. Well, Joyce, what's God saying to you? Oh, get up. Go to work, be a blessing, love me. Sometimes I'll go for a long time and God won't say anything specific to me. Well, what do you do? I just keep doing the last thing he said. <laughs> Hello. You know, I read all these books about dry times and dry seasons and dark nights of the soul. And I know about all that, but I'll be honest and tell you, I don't have that mess anymore. You know why? Because I know that 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 I know. And when you know that you know that you know, I don't have to feel God to know that He's here. I just know. And the only way you get that is by experience. And whether you like it or not, God's giving you some divine experience. The only way you get that is by going through stuff, not by being delivered from everything that's uncomfortable. When you were young, Peter, you girded yourself and you did what you wanted to. But when you grow old, another will gird you and lead you where you do not wish to go. Does anybody understand this? What if God doesn't give you what you want? Thank you for your great response. Man, death just fell in the whole place. It's like, oh. well, well, he will, won't he? <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> Because maybe what you want, maybe what you think you want could be the worst thing in the world for you and you just don't even know that yet. Well, fear is a dead end and all it really does is allow the enemy to work in your life. But faith opens the door to God and gives you a future. Now, I think that is really good news. Keep that in mind. Fear is a dead end, but faith is an open door for God to work in your life.
But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, it's really great to have the ability to feed children all around the world. And I have a goal and a desire to keep feeding more and more all the time. This after-school feeding program serves an average of 90 to 100,000 hot meals per One year. One meal for these kids is, is survival. Well, I'm here in Thailand at one of our children's homes. You can feed, house, and educate a child. Hope Cambodia has been absolutely amazing. We've opened 15 different orphanages. And we're so grateful to be able to build this well here in Sri Lanka. We love to get clean drinking water to people. Well, so the water they're drinking is not making their children sick, and it's, it's not dirty, contaminated water. <laughs> definitely feel in Haiti just the absolute desperation. I'm at the Cure Hospital in Malawi, Africa. A huge line of people who are waiting to see our nurses and our doctors. Many doctors and medical people have volunteered their time. We are in Summers Point, New Jersey. Well, today we're, we're in Joppa, Missouri. We're here in Haiti in the village, and we're about to move people into brand new houses we've built. The winds were so constant with these big, big gusts. It was terrifying. 150 or more were killed. Thousands left homeless. Hey, you there, guys? Uh, those gifts from Joyce Five Ministries. Here in Zimbabwe, I was able to hand out the two millionth bag in a prison. That you can have a different life today. Don't know how many, you know, lives you guys save by coming in and showing the love that you guys show. Human trafficking, today's term for modern slavery. We've been working in different parts of the world and providing a, a place for women to come out of that lifestyle and be restored. It, it, there's no limit here. This is, this is ran by God. He changes lives in Project Hope. You can change, you can get healing, you can survive. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand.